linear gradient palettes are cohesive and readable. But a linear gradient palette can be constructed with our knowledge of warm and cool and how those are structured, and then by abstracting that and playing with that, creating new maps, color maps, or linear gradient palettes from that. What Newton did was he had light coming through the wall, a hole in the wall, and sh shone the light through the prism and projected uh, an image of a spectrum onto the wall. But Goethe's approach was instead to put the prism in front of his eye and to examine how it distorted an image in front of him rather than putting the light through the prism. He uh, put his vision through the prism. Take a look at this. Okay, do you see that black line I've drawn here? On the top, what sort of colors do you see? You might see, it depends on the quality of the screen or the quality of the stream on YouTube here, but you might see some cyan, some nice bright cyan. Then it darkens into kind of a more indigo before it fades to black. And on the bottom, you should see the black fading into like a red and then orange and then yellow. In those series of colors, hue and lightness shift together. So indigo becomes blue, becomes cyan, at the same time as darker becomes medium, becomes lighter. Hue, which color it is, and lightness, how light it is, shift together. They're aligned. To try and help visualize what this all means, this is like the wackiest thing ever. I made it out of pipe cleaners and sculpture wire. What's happening is this is showing us if I were to plot those two series of colors I just described, if I were to plot them into a color space, this is what it looks like. The red, right, we're going from black to dark red to bright red. Once it hits its full saturation, it starts to loop around. It goes to orange, to amber, to yellow. Once it hits yellow, it starts to lose saturation, so now it starts to loop back toward the center. The same thing's happening on the other side. We start with black. As I add more wavelengths, it goes to indigo, it goes to blue. As it reaches its full saturation, it loops around. I can't get any more saturated, so I'm gonna shift hue. And then it gets to cyan, and then it begins to lose saturation as it goes toward white as I keep adding more and more wavelengths until I have all of them at white light. If I turn it sideways, I get a couple other interesting views that are worth noting. This way, if I look at it this way, you can see red and blue are like, or red and indigo, right, are the warm and cool dark colors, right, closer to black. And they're kind of forming a pair. And then as the hue shifts, it actually moves together. And then yellow and cyan are the light warm and cool colors. This figure shows us, right, I've, basically I've just done this, I've turned it this way. This figure is now showing us complementary pairs, but you've got to go through the center. So dark indigo is complementary to light yellow. If I look at cyan up here, cyan, if I go through the center point, is complementary to red. And then if I go across like azure blue, this middle blue, is complementary to orange. These complementary pairs mean that these two systems, these two loops, are complementary. If I go across any two colors are going to add up to white. A linear gradient palette can be constructed with our knowledge of warm and cool and how those are structured. Here is how we want to define readability. Number one, if I change it to grayscale, it's not going to lose any contrast. It'll still be readable in grayscale. What that means is, for example, I can't use two colors in the gradient that, although they're different in hue, have the same lightness level. And that's got to be perceptual lightness level, not what HSL thinks it is. So no loss of contrast, which would mean loss of meaning. I can't tell these two apart if I convert it to grayscale. The second thing that would define a palette as readable would be that all the lightness contrasts are maintained for the color vision limited. I mean, if we're really concerned about monochromatic vision, folks, that limits our options a lot. If we're only concerned about the more common forms like deuteronomaly, deuteronopia, um, that does limit our choices, but not as, as much. And that's where most people kind of aim their accessibility efforts in color and information design. The third thing is that for it to be readable, contrast between steps in gradient, should be an S, in gradients are perceptually uniform. So if I have a gradient of nine steps, right? Not infinite steps between, but just got a palette of nine colors, evenly spaced steps in between, those evenly spaced steps have to be perceptually uniform as well. I can't rely on RGB. I can't rely on HSL because it's not perceptually uniform. If you haven't figured this out already, what kind of naturally occurring linear gradient palettes already follow all three of these? Those would be the warm edge colors and the cool edge colors. Those edge color series discovered by Goethe are in fact like 
the primordial example of readable gradient palettes. First, I want to look at someone else's attempt to say, okay, can I systematically generate palettes that are like that? So let's take a look at the matplotlib gradients. Let's throw in Viridis. This is Viridis. You can see it goes from black to like a violet, then to a, an azure blue through the blue greens, and then these very desaturated yellows, and then to white. This should be good for uh, coding a data set that is linear, that, you know, different quantities of one measurement in gracefully degrade to monochrome and all that kind of stuff. Is it perfect? There, there are critics. Peter Karpov is one of those. He's a computer scientist who's done a lot of uh, thinking and writing about these types of palettes. And he says these aren't, this one particularly is not great. There are probably some places where you're going to lose discrimination, hue discrimination. But anyway, the point is, if you rotate this, you can see that it's trying to do the same sort of thing that the warm edge and cool edge loops do in this space. It's creating a helix. This figure that curves in more than one dimension. Let's take a look also at um, magma. You can see it's doing the same thing, but going through different hues, right? Um, it is again like the warm circuit, tracing a circular path in terms of hue, forming this helical shape. I don't think these designers said, let's do this based on the warm and cool loops. I think they arrived at it like convergent evolution, right? They said, well, these hue shifts and these value shifts are going to have to trace this helical path in order to maintain readability. We can take all of that and actually abstract it further. This is basically exactly designed to do the kind of thing we're talking about uh, and to do the kind of thing that the people who created the Veritas palettes engineered their way into. I've played with this a bit and other people have as well and they've looked at kind of here's the default setting like that's actually not attractive. It does have that black to white so therefore all of the values are different so it would degrade nicely to monochromatic like it's it's got that going for it but the hue shifts in there you know they end up almost looking like faded RGB uh, going through the whole RGB rainbow. So a better approach would be actually to limit the number of rotations. We're on 1.5 rotations around the color wheel. We're going to specify the value here to like 0.3. And you can see it's, it's tempting to call it monochromatic, but it's not because it is shifting 0.3 around the color space. So a third of a turn or about 120 degrees around the RGB color space. I have found that values between about 0.2 and 0.6 give you good readable color maps. So here's 0.2, here's 0.6. You get some hue shift that starts to look a little bit like Viridis, right? But not too much hue shift that it's like going around all the colors and uh, is less aesthetically pleasing, I guess, right? A limited palette should be limited. So let's set these settings to actually make our Cool Edge series. So let's just put in 1.5 and see where that leaves us. It's not clipping and it is going from like an indigo to a cyan. So this is pretty pretty close to our actual cool color wedge. If I want to do the warm colors, I'm going to change the rotation because we know the red loop, the red to yellow to white loop goes the other way. So I'll go positive and we'll see where we end up. Ugh. But we want our red a little bit redder. Let's change our value. That's a little bit closer. And so that's a nice smooth uh, warm edge color series. And this is the kind of thing you could use as a color map for info design. It's the kind of thing you could use to paint a digital painting of like people lit by a campfire. Like that's perfect for that. So this is a tool that I encourage you to play with. Just play with all the different settings. Like I said, the best rotation values I found are between 0.2 and 0.6, but go wild and see what happens, you know, play with it and explore. And let's take a look at Colorbox a little bit. So this other thing I linked for you is called Colorbox. There's actually a newer version that doesn't provide as much visualization. It's just colorbox.io. It's a it's a cleaner, simpler tool to use if you already know what you're doing. So how do I turn this into a warm loop just, just so we can kind of navigate this a bit? So we actually in, in Hue, if you click view graph for Hue, it will change what graph it's showing you. So here's my curve of how Hue is changing. Let's actually set the starting point at 60, which is yellow, uh, close enough. And then let's set the ending point at red. It's already starting to look like our warm circuit. Let us now take the saturation. So that you can see is clipping when it gets into the oranges and reds. So then what you can start to do is play with the different curves. These are all like very mathy, right? But they're just describing how the Bezier curve or the, the vector path that the program is making the, the color shift go through, 
how that's being calculated. How many control points does it have? So for example, a quadratic one, I believe is just two control points plus an origin. And then I think the quintic one, the quartic and the quintic one would be like four control points, five control points, exponential, whatever. These are all different kinds of linear functions basically. So let's play, let's do quintic. And then the other term, ease in, ease out, ease in, out. I think um, those of you who do motion graphics would know about that, right? That's just describing where where it's more gradual and where it's more steep, either at the beginning or at the end of the transition, right? So if I do ease in, right, you see the values from the left is a much more gradual curve. If I do ease out, it's clipped at top, but the values at the other end are the ones that are more gradual. And if I do ease in and ease out, you can see that the gradual shifts are at both ends and the sharp shift is in the center. And then we've also got to play with the third dimension, which is brightness. And we got to bring the, the end brightness a lot lower because if you recall, it should end in black. And so here we go. We've adjusted all these three curves to give us something pretty close to our warm edge series. And this would be just one of many possible ways to construct a very good readable palette. You can, dis you can construct bad palettes with this tool, but if you kind of keep in your head the way that these helical things move through the color space that I demonstrated for you, then you can, con you can use this tool to construct good ones.